Welcome to People's Stories and Success. I am Coach Asan. I'm very happy to welcome our guest today, and his name is Dave Sanderson. Did I pronounce that correct? You did, Asan. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> oh, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm really excited to uh, get to know you and uh, all the stories you have to share with us. So um, let's start by getting to know you and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you very much. So I, uh, you know, I grew up in the Midwest outside of Cincinnati. Um, then my dad got transferred to the uh, western, north, northwestern Virginia. So that's where I sort of grew up through my junior high school and high school age. I, I did a lot of sports, but then uh, I wanted to play football in college, but I hurt my knee on the first practice day of the uh, James Madison University. So I never realized that dream, but I majored uh, in international business, which I was one of the first people to graduate in that uh, discipline of James Madison. So we really started a program because at that point, international business was just sort of coming into play as a, as a discipline in a lot of different schools. So I was really, uh, my goal was to go internationally, travel internationally, be one of those sort of James Bond kind of guys, right? Uh, and I was single, but uh, as you know, because you've traveled the world likewise, uh, coming out at 22, you're not quite prepared to do those things you think you, you are prepared for. So uh, like yourself, I, uh, my dad, uh, my dad, my first lesson in leadership came from my dad because he said I had 30 days to get out of the house after college to have a job or I was going to be out. And at 30 days, I didn't. So he got me a job in the hospitality industry and I started managing restaurants, which I knew nothing about uh, because uh, at that point, all I knew is you went, went and ate at a restaurant. That's all I knew about. But uh, great learning experience because it was two things. Number one, the leadership lesson my dad gave me is you stick to your word, uh, which was a great lesson for me. But second, I learned a whole new discipline in hospitality. Um, hotel restaurant was amazing and then uh, we got purchased by Marriott uh, so I got to go to from Howard Johnson to a Marriott uh, which, was a, which was a big learning experience but then my uh, fiance at that point said uh, I am not moving any further north because I was one of those guys who I was on the transition teams so I would go for six months or six three to six months open a store and then go to the next store um, and my next stop my last stop was Vienna Virginia my next stop was be Baltimore Philadelphia and she said, I'm not going any further north. So I quit that job, came back to Charlotte, North Carolina, and started my sales career um, okay. selling copiers. And then for the last 30 plus years, I've been in sales and sales management. And then in addition to that, I was the head or director of security for a gentleman by the name of Tony Robbins. So I got to travel with Tony all over the world and uh, support his mission. But then the miracle on the Hudson came, and then it was time to realize my mission. So wow. that's a quick about a minute and a half uh, from zero to 56 years old. <laughs> There's so much uh, to cover there. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, when you first started in the hospitality industry yep. and you're getting those important skills about customer right. service and getting to know your customer and serving. Uh, what are some of the things that you learned right away that helped you along your transitions to different careers? Or well, I think, <clears throat> great question. There's <clears throat> excuse me, really two things I would say. Number one, it really taught me how to be with people of all different type of um, ages, cultures. Because as you know, in the hospitality industry, you're dealing with a lot of different type of people, not only with the back of the house, but also the front of the house. So that was a great skill for me to have. Because at 22 and 23, you think you're Superman, you're bulletproof. And all of a sudden you realize you know nothing about the real world. You know, the college was like fantasy land for four years and <clears throat> you had a chance to have a good time and all of a sudden you're out in the real world. So that was one great lesson. But I'll say the second thing that I learned is stuck with me today. It still sticks with me, basically helped me do my sales career. And even today, what I do is speaking and, and writing books and things that I do is I, the last, the last um, time I was with Mary, I was like, I mentioned in Vienna, Virginia, and it was Christmas Eve. And uh, I don't know if you know where Marriott's headquarters are there in Bethesda, Maryland, which is right around the Beltline. And management team would go out during the holidays and go out to the stores and right visit people and see how things are going. And I got the lucky straw that day on Christmas Eve where all stuff was breaking loose. Because Vienna is right outside of Washington, D.C. It's right on the belt line at 495, which is extremely, extremely busy. Mm -hmm. So we were just getting slammed. And all of a sudden, I have Bill Marriott, the CEO and chairman of Marriott, and his entourage walk in. And uh, I was like, oh, my goodness, you know, what's going on now, right? So he walks in, he greets him comes up greasy says is there anything you need can i help you with anything also i'm thinking number one said if i say i needed help he's probably thinking guy can't handle it 
or C, B, if I say I don't need help, you say the guy can't handle it. So I'm in a no-win situation. I said, sir, I, I actually do need somebody to drop fries. Hmm. And he looked at me and said, where's your apron? Uh. And he went to the back and started dropping fries. And when he went back, all his guys were just standing in the front. He goes, guys, start busting tables. And here I am. I have the CEO and chairman of Marriott in the back and his entourage busting tables. And we got done, settled down. He came up, talked to me just for a minute or so. He said, I want you to remember one thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said, my name is on that building. You're never too good to do any job when your name's on the building. And that taught me a lesson that you're never too good to do anything. You know, as you know, if not in a corporate world, I mean, I had no challenges doing anything from the sales end, from the consulting end, to make sure the customer got served. But the second thing was, uh, it really served me as an entrepreneur because, Kaylee, right now, you know, as an entrepreneur, you start out, you pretty much by yourself. You got to build a team and you got to build culture. And it's, it's great to be able to have that kind of culture within my little group. And But right now, I'm not too good to do anything. But right now, I'm doing everything. So uh, those are really some of the great lessons I learned by being in hospitality, especially by having the honor to be with a gentleman named Bill Marriott, who is, who is amazing, has an amazing company. Well, that's a great experience. And thank you for sharing that. That's a very important lesson uh, to actually learn. Because as I started at the front desk of a, a company called Swiss Hotel, which is also in similar to Marriott, um, when you do all the different jobs, you understand as a leader what the different challenges are. And what exactly needs to be done. Unless you do the job, you really don't, uh, sometimes you don't really understand as, as well. Exactly, you learn how to change a bed and all of a sudden you're seeing what, what it takes to change a bed, right? <laughs> it's a great skill to have personally to go home and be able to, so you're exactly right. I mean, because you were in the front desk, I did it at the front desk too, but be in a hotel restaurant. Mm -hmm. You learn all these things that these people do, it's like, whoa, there's a lot <laughs> of things that go into it, man. And not to mention, uh, you meet all these interesting people. Yeah. And oftentimes, at least for me, uh, going through it, you, you don't realize the lessons that you're learning. But when you look back, it, oftentimes it's connecting the dots, looking back, that, that gives you those value, valuable moments. I totally agree because I met my first mentor when I was managing the, the restaurant here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I now live. And he, his name was Bill. And Bill... Um, it was one of those guys, like you said, you never know who you're going to meet. He was in the restaurant one day. He uh, wore a flannel shirt. And he drove a pickup truck. And that's all I really knew about Bill. As I got to know Bill, I found out Bill owned 80 movie theaters through North and South Carolina. Bill was a multimillionaire, and Bill was like the Sam Walton of Charlotte. And fortunately for me, he took me under his wing. And so he, he, was, uh, he was kind enough to do that and give me those life lessons that you, you, know, you, can't, you can't get from that 50 or 60 years of experience. You can compress your decades of their experience on your days to be able to do something. And that's what helped me dramatically grow from what I did is those life lessons. Um, and so it's a great experience. And let's talk a little bit about uh, finding a mentor because oftentimes that makes a huge difference. So, uh, so at a point that we're talking about your, with the hospitality industry, did you have a mentor at that point? I did not. And Bill would come in every morning to get coffee. I mean, you know, he's, he, like I said, he was a multimillionaire. He'd come in, just have a coffee, have a smoke. And, you know, and he'd come by, we talk, and I'd give him, give him some coffee, he'd get some ice cream. But all of a sudden, you strike up that relationship. And he saw, I think he saw something in me, the drive, you know, because I was the assistant manager at that point, because you just don't go in being a, you know, hotel food and beverage manager. You got to start at the bottom, right? And I was like second assistant manager. So I was, I was a guy do a second shift and all the all nighters. So I think he took pity on me, but he, uh, he never talked down to me. He never talked down to me. And so he took me on and that taught me a great lesson about, you know, needing a mentor. And that's why I, I mentor people today. I'm honored to do that. I've had multiple mentors, but the power of having someone to give it to you straight and give you candid feedback and sort of give you that direction when you think you know everything uh, I encourage everybody. That's what I do what I do uh, it's because I want to get my message out and be able to help other people because I think it's my obligation. Bill took me under his wing. It's my obligation to share those lessons with other people. And that's why I do what I do. Hmm. So, uh, you know, here you have Bill and he mentored you through uh, what are a couple of things or a few points that uh, you'd like to share with us that uh, Bill kind of instilled in you that helped you make that that leap to the next next step? I'll tell you one specifically, because this is the one that really hit home to me. I was, um, you know, I was, I was doing all right. 
right? And I was I moved from because I mentioned I moved from Vienna. I sort of lost connection, but he and I maintained connection. So when I got back to Charlotte, I re reopened that conversation. Now I'm in sales. So I called Bill one day. It's, I, I got his direct number, and it was back then you didn't have cell phones. So yeah, I got his office number. He knew it, so I went right through to Bill. I said, Bill, I need some help. I said, How does somebody become a leader? And then he gave me one of those life lessons. He goes, if you want to be anything in your life, put yourself around the peer group that you want to be like, and they will elevate you to that standard. Now, you got to remember, I'm 25, 26 years old now, right? I'm, I'm a young buck. I'm like, how can I fast track this thing, right? How can I go from zero to 100? I said, well, I'll go to a business seminar for business leaders, right? He said, get yourself around it, right? Do that. So I paid $4,000 to sign up to do this business seminar in San Diego, California. And my wife thought I was crazy because we're about ready to have our first child. Here I spent four grand to go to California and have a good time and jump up and down, right? So I got there and I looked at the agenda. One of the things on that agenda, we were doing this thing called a mission statement. Now back in the early 90s, no one really knew what a mission statement was. That was Stephen Covey was just start coming in his, his world, right? That's right? So no one really knew what it was, but you know what? I paid $4,000, man, I'm all in, right? I'm gonna do whatever this guy says, you know, I'm gonna do, right? So I did. It was October 4th, 1994, and I write my mission statement out. It was I, Dave Sanderson, see, here, feel, and know the purpose of my life is to be happy, realize I accomplish anything I desire, and have faith in my creator, inspiring others to be the same. Now, I put it down, and the gentleman who was leading the seminar said, don't look at it for six, nine months to a year. Just immerse yourself, right? Get yourself, because you'll change it, and you'll start vetting your assets. So I did exactly what he said. But six, nine, 12 months later, I looked at it, I'm like, man, I'm a loser, I am not doing any of this, and I can't tell my wife because I paid 4000 bucks. But then I tell people all of a sudden, January 15, 2009 comes, and that mission is immediately realized. So the lesson I, I, I take, take out as a number of lessons, but one lesson I tell youth especially is, is about delayed gratification. you got to put your time in. you know, you got to earn the right to live that mission. And I needed another you know, 17 years or whatever to, live, you know, to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I did it, as soon as I did it, it was presented to me on January 15th. It's part called the miracle on the Hudson. All of a sudden that mission was immediately realized. Now I'm impacting people all over the world. So let's talk about uh, the miracle on Hudson. So that, so here you are, you know, going through your sales career and had you already uh, worked with Tony Robbins at that point? So I went, so after all this started going, I, I went to another seminar because I, 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 I ended up the Tony Robbins seminar. And, you know, so I started doing go to seminar and all of a sudden that year I was came the number one salesperson in my company. That then uh, the company I was with at that point was called ADP, Automatic Data Process. I was became the number one sales guy in my division for the entire world. I lost 25 pounds and all of a sudden things are on, I'm on seventh heaven. Right? I'm doing great. So I said, well, I need more now. If I can do this, how much more? So I started volunteering at his events. Yeah. So I would be the guy at midnight in Maui, Hawaii, at midnight putting brochures down on the seats for the people the next day, right? Just to volunteer. I, I, they paid me nothing. I paid my own way, but I wanted to be around the energy. But one day in Maui, his former wife sort of got put in a situation. She was talking to two gentlemen, and, you know, you didn't know where it was going. You know, probably nothing wrong with But I went up to her and said, Mr. Robbins, he's in the back, Mrs. Robbins. And she says, excuse me. So I walked her back. She goes, you handled that pretty well. Would you like to be on Tony Security? I'm like, that's a lot better putting brochures down, man. Mm -hmm. So she put me in the back of his green room, the back door. So all I did is sit for four days at his back door and just watch. And all of a sudden, he started having confidence in me, right? He put me on stage with him. And then he made me his assistant security director. So I was in charge of the entire team. And then he made me a security director, which means I was in charge of him and the team. So then I was traveling with him all over the world. I had, I had proximity. And I could hear and see how he could move people. And that's how it became, that's how I all work with, all because I served, served somebody, right? It opened up a door for me and I decided I'll sit there for four days, right? And all I did is sit in the door for four days and all this started opening up. So you had your mentor, um, then you went to this Tony Robbins seminar and so something happened uh, when you wrote down your mission statement right? Um, and that kind of catapulted you to, you know, you're making big sales. What are some of the things that you think took place, some changes maybe that took place within you to make that happen? Okay. Are you able to identify a few things like that? Uh, yeah. I, I, and, and I did a media interview the other day and this question came up and I, I said, I think what really happened and is what Tony taught and what Tom Hawkins taught and what Jim Rohn taught, all these guys I went to Earl Nightingale, right? Stephen Covey, all these guys I went to, right? And it started immersing things, but, 
one thing I did, which I think a lot of people don't do, because I went to a lot of, a lot of things with Tony, and I see it, right, mm -hmm. is I actually did what he, he taught. I actually just implemented what he said. So I did it and I learned it and internalized it. So when I got into a sales associate, you know, situation, I could draw on those skills. And here I am. And one of the things, one of my companies my, my, could never understand is how am I getting in stuff from the CEO of a major company when everybody else couldn't get past the manager of IT. And I, cause I, I, and I used the strategy. I, I ask a different level of question and I focused on them. Right. Because one of the companies really had an issue with me focusing on my clients instead of focusing on the bottom line for us. And I struggled. They, and, I, and that was a struggle for me because I always the client knew that I was there 24 hours a day for him, and I would go to bat. So when you're sitting across as you've been probably with the CEO, he wants to know you're in the game with him. Right. You're you're, you're you got as much skin in the game as I got. And that's what I always did. So I asked different level of questions of them. And what the questions I asked the executives, whether it's a CFO, CIO, CEO, whoever it was, CMO was what's most important to you and what has to happen for you to realize that? See, what I wanted to find out is what's in, inside their, their soul, right? What's driving them? It's not that I need to have more turns in, over in, in, in the warehouse, right? It's, yeah, this is what I need to accomplish. So I, once I knew that, I knew the strategy that I had to employ is really is how to serve that need. Not, can my system do this, 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 and this? We'll figure that out, right? As you know in your IT, you figure it out. It's those internal things, the internal wins. So I, I got to know the internal wins of the executive teams. So all I did is get my team and try to get them focused on that. Let me focus on that. And one of the great other lessons I learned is I had to learn how to delegate and step out. Because one of the things Tony taught me, and I heard this because of a conversation he had with the former president of the United States um, when he got impeached. And Tony tells, tells one of us the story is when he had, he got called that day when that, that gentleman, that president got impeached. And the president called him and said, what do I do? He goes, first you should have called me earlier, right? Uh, so I could help you. But the second thing was is the power of disassociation. And Tony taught us, he teaches it, but he taught us that skill. Because being in security, you got to be able to disassociate from the emotion. Hmm. So I, could, I had the skill set to help people and disassociate, especially from my team, from let them deal with the stuff. Let me deal with the big picture, the mission. Mm -hmm. And I always set a mission, right? And then we did the mission. And I live and die. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You don't get every one. But... I won, I won a lot more than I lost, especially on bigger ones. And all of a sudden, I made, made my note on some very big companies, right? My, people see all these names, like, how is he doing this? It's because of the strategy, the way I play. I just did what I was taught, you know? That's excellent. And, you know, one thing that kind of comes, you know, strikes me at talking to leaders is being authentic, being who you are, rather than trying to be somebody, somebody else, because that always comes across, doesn't it? Most definitely. You know, two things that Tony always taught me, and people, one of the things people always ask me about Tony, is he authentic, is he congruent? Because you see him out there, right, doing his stuff. And I was with him, and I said, one thing I can tell you about Tony Robbins, he is authentic, and he is, he is congruent. Now, there were times in his life, I think he had those challenges, but now he is totally congruent. You see the messages he's giving out now, it's, 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 in, it's in his body. And so that lesson taught me, it's one of the things he, he told me after the, after the miracle on the Hudson, we were talking because I was doing a lot of media, uh, you know, especially I was actually going to the West Coast, do a lot of media. He, he was coaching me, he said, just be congruent and be authentic and be humble. And I've never forgot that. So everything that I do, I'm trying to focus on being authentic, be humble, be congruent. And those are the three things I focus on. Excellent. So let's uh, go to that particular day, uh, Miracle on Hudson. Uh, at that point, uh, you were working for Tony Robbins? I still had the security for Tony Robbins, and I still had my position with Oracle. I was a sales manager in the CPG, Consumer Package Goods Division, which uh, managed primarily the, the large accounts in the Southeast for Oracle for that, that division. I see. And so, you know, in your own words, tell us, the events of that day, if you want to summarize however you'd yep. like, uh, go ahead and share that with us. So we were in a three-day business trip. We started in Sarasota, Florida, went to Petersburg, Virginia, and then we ended up in Brooklyn in the warehouse. Uh, the same company, we're doing, we're doing supply chain evaluation. That's what we were doing for system checks, basically say, checking your systems out. So we were in a three-day business, a Thursday, right? And and I don't know if you've ever been and worked in a warehouse. You probably have. If you've been in IT, you've probably been in a warehouse or distribution center. 
they open up quite early in the morning. Data this centers. One, yes. Yeah, this one up, opened up at 2 o'clock in the morning. So we started our day at 5 because we wanted to be in there where all the action was going on. When the trucks were coming in, the loads were going out, we wanted to see the, the process, right? So we started day at 5, so we got done about 10. Now, being in IT like you were, you probably probably did a similar strategy. I always booked the last flight out because you never know how that day is going to go, right? It could go great or it could go sideways pretty quick. So I booked the 5 o'clock flight out, but we got done at 10. Now, I'm in New York. There's flights every hour, right, in New York and LaGuardia. So I called a travel agent at Oracle, worked with her, and she put me on flight 1549. So I wasn't supposed to put me on that plane. So, you know, I, so I had status with U.S. Airways because I travel 100,000 miles a year, right? So I had status. So I was one of the first passengers to board the plane, you know, along with the people who they call right first, right? Went back to my seat, seat 15A, left side, four rows behind the left wing. And I did exactly what I did every single time I signed it. You probably did and still do. I, I did. I just picked up the magazine, started to read. I did not listen to the flight crew, pay attention, right? So my head's down, I'm reading the magazine, I don't care, I know everything, right? I know everything's gonna go on a plane. But then about 60 seconds, 70 seconds after we took off, we heard that explosion. Okay. And it was a loud explosion, so it got my attention. I'm like, look up, I looked out the window, I saw fire coming out underneath the left wing. So I knew something had happened, but you know, I flew so often, the plane lost an engine. I know all planes have multiple engines. That's he's going back to LaGuardia because I found him banking. I thought he's going back to the airport, but that's what's one of the biggest parts of the backstory doesn't get told is what happened. What happened left side plane also happened right side plane simultaneously. Because I truly believe if you were bang bang instead of one bang, then people would have panicked. But no one panicked because people thought we have another engine and we're going back to the airport. But we didn't because you know now as you saw the movie, saw he banked to go down the Hudson River. So we're still going down the river because there's water. So you're like, okay, going back to the airport until we cross over the George Washington Bridge. And he cleared the bridge by about 400 plus feet. And the bridge is roughly 600 feet up. So he's roughly 1,000 plus feet somewhere in that area. So when I looked out the window down, people were looking up. And you can see, actually see people's faces. That's how close to the bridge you were. He doesn't get enough credit for that. So that's when he said his famous words, this is your captain, brace for impact. That's the only thing he said. And then the word I used in the interviews, and I, I always used the word, that's the one I knew was serious. Then I heard Captain Sullenberger said he thought it was dire. So I'll use his word because it's got more impact. And that's sort of a pretty dire situation. So it was about 60 seconds after he crossed over the bridge when we crashed into the river. It was a hard hit. He hit it perfectly, but it was a hard hit. So I went back in my seat and up in my seat. When I came up, I looked out the window. I saw light through the window. But so I knew I had a shot. I was alive. I survived the plane crash, but the water came in because as he landed the plane, he stripped the bottom of the plane off and somebody tried to open up the back door because that's what they were told to do, right? The closest exit, but which may be behind you. So all of a sudden, you know, that's the one thing you do not do in water. It's FYI, a lesson for everybody. If you're flying and you're in the water, do not open the back door because water starts rushing in really quickly. So now the water's coming in from underneath and behind the plane. So we were about waist deep in the water where I was sitting. It went all the way up to you know, about chest level in the back and all the way down to ankle level in the front. So I'm like, whoa, time to get out, right? Time to go. So I got up and went to the aisle because I wasn't, you know, I said, just get up, get up, get, get to the aisle, get up and get out. It was my, it was my strategy. But when that happened, I got to the aisle, something else happened. Then my mom, who had passed away in 1997, started talking to me in my head. I heard her talk. I said, I heard her say, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And I tell people, I never realized this about my mom, but one thing my mom usually did as we grew up is she would never tell us what to do. She would give us a choice, make us make a choice based on our own values, which is a great lesson for people. And that's why I tell you, it's a great lesson. Let people make their own choice. Hopefully their values will step up, but let them make the choice. And I always hung around with a lot of guys and had a crew and all that. We always took care of each other. So I went towards the back of the plane to see if anybody needed help. Because I, at the back, I didn't know what was going on in the back of the plane. So I climbed over and got to the back of the plane and then got behind. There was one elderly lady needed all help and two women did a great job of getting her moving. And I got behind them. So I'm moving up behind them. So I was the last passenger getting out from the back of the plane. All of a sudden, not only some of the seats break back, but the bins are broken open and luggage is flown out and you're waist deep in the water. Oh. So all stuff's breaking loose. Mm -hmm. So all the further I could get up was 10 F on the right side, the exit door on the right. So I'm like, I'm bailing out, right? I'm getting out. So I get to the door, start to step out. And I look up. And there's no room on the wing for me. There's no room on the boat. So that's why I was inside the, the plane, you know, 36 degree water, waist deep, you know, for about seven minutes. And then I started holding on to the lifeboat because the lifeboat started floating out from the plane because of the current and the river. So they were holding, you know, hold on. So I was holding on to a lifeboat 
inside of a plane waist deep in the water. And fortunately for me, the, when I was on Good Morning America, the first picture they show was me hanging out of the plane, holding on to life. But that's how I knew I found out that I was the last passenger. I didn't know until that point mm-hmm. that I was the last passenger out. But then I was in the plane for about seven minutes until I, you know, uh, one of the uh, boats hit the front of the plane and shook the plane. I felt water go up my back. Mm-hmm. And I said, man, I'm out. This thing's going down, right? It's, it's going down. Get out. Because the worst thing you can do, two, two worst things you can do on a plane is being a fire or you're stuck in a plane that's going to the bottom, bottom of water. Yeah, there's no way to get out. Right. So I jumped in and swam to the closest boat that I could find, which happened to be the end of that wing. And to this day, EMTs, the only way they can explain it, because there's no way, I, I've been in 36 degree water for seven minutes plus and swam another to get there is adrenaline. Mm. Because, I mean, physically, there's no way that anybody should be able to survive just that portion. Right. But adrenaline got me that and that's how I got off the plane. And what was the mindset or how did the passengers react as this was happening yep. as the incident was taking place? Well, see, no one lost their heads. And I, when I do my, one of the things I talk, tell my, especially my business talk about leadership, I tell a distinction that was made to me by Captain Stellenberger. He, he told a few of us, we were actually in the green room of the early show on CBS. And this, I was, he was telling us this, because once somebody asked him, why do you think this thing happened the way it did? And he said, I'll, he said, I'll tell you what I think would happen. He said, he thinks the outcome, because he got it down. He gets all the credit getting down, but getting out is a, is a crew of passengers. It's a team effort. Mm-hmm. Is the passenger makeup of that plane. Because if you've flown into New York, which you probably have, you're an IT, I did it all the time. I did it probably once every month, right, going in out of New York. Those flights going out of New York are primarily business people. Right. You know, financial, financial services and things like that. So roughly 90 plus percent of that plane was business people who travel by themselves all the time, who can handle stuff. So the variables, you know, we had a lady with a couple babies. We had a couple family people. Other than that, it was business people who could handle stuff themselves. So I think – at that point, people sort of went into their business mindsets, like, okay, I got to focus in and get this thing done and get, get out. Mm-hmm. So the only variables you have are like four or five people who didn't travel a lot, okay. which made a big difference. So that's a lesson I tell people. It's really important to see, you know, number one, know your strategy. But second, uh, see who else is like the people in the seats on the bus, as they say, right? And that can determine everything in your company and your business. If you don't have the right people in the right seats on the bus, they can take you down. If they, we didn't have the right people in the right seats, because there were people who did great things on this plane. You know, I mean, I, I think I did, I, I contributed, I think, it, uh, but some people were not meant to do that. Because that, their mindset was out. So if they were in the right seats on that plane, this thing could have turned a whole different direction. It's a teamwork happening among groups of people that made a big difference. Who did not know each other, who did not care about each other. Mm-hmm. That's what I tell people too. And I tell people, and especially when I work with teams, just think about this. In six minutes, you had 155 people who did not know each other, who didn't care about each other, pulled together and did something that had never been done in the history of aviation. Just think of your team who do care about each other, who know about each other, could you just get that common mission, right? And focus, get all the distractions out of the way, focus in on that one, what you can accomplish if you care. We didn't care about each other, right? We had a common mission though, zero fatalities. And it's interesting how your mom's voice came to you, lessons that she taught you through example, rather than telling you what to do. She kind of led by example. Right. She, and that was a wisdom of my mother. My mother was very unassuming. She was, was one of those nice six, 1960s moms, right? I mean, they did what they were, did, were told, right? But they gave you these lessons, right, that you never think that you're going to think about. That's why I named my book, Asan, Moments Matter. Because what I realized, all these moments in my life added up to that one big moment. And my, and my big moment was a plane crash. And I tell people, I, when I tell people, it's everybody who's listening to this and you and me here will have that one moment in life. It's called a personal plane crash. Whether it's a fire, a flood, which we just happened in Houston and Florida, right? Fires out in California, health scare, cancer. Something's going to happen to you because no one skates through life unscathed. No one does. It's that moment, right? So all, you got to remember, all these moments add up for a reason. That's what my book's about. And, you know, that's, that's so important for people to take the lesson from you and pick up your book because you're absolutely correct. These things happen, and we need to be aware of it 
And there may not be a specific way to train for it per se, but just to educate ourselves through people who have gone through certain experiences in life that have taught them things, right? Like yep. yourself. So tell us a little bit about the book. Um, it sounds like you had a big impact in helping a lot of people um, come out to safety. Um, so great job there. Now, now what happens to Dave? So I, I appreciate you saying that because just before I share that, I think you made a very important point because especially right now, it's a lot easier than it was when I grew up because I talk about the power of virtual references. Where you know, it used to be where like Bill was my mentor. He was my ref. I had physical access to Bill. Nowadays, you don't have to have physical access. You got the internet. You got social media, right? You can read about it. So you, you, there's other people have gone through it. But after this happened, I was still working for Oracle. I was still had a security for Tony, right? And all, but all of a sudden, this is thrust upon me. And I could have done what a lot of people did: just go back to work, right, and let it go. But I knew this was my path, and and. What happened was, and it really, and I knew, I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't know when it was going to happen. Every time I would pick Tony Robbins up, whether it's from the helipad or the airport or wherever, and escort him, he'd ask me the same question every time. It doesn't matter where we were. We were in London, where we were in Sydney, whether we were in L.A., it doesn't matter. You know, when are you going to start working for yourself? Why are you still working for the man? And I can only come up with so many answers, right? I mean, it's like you can only – BS so long, right? I mean, it's like he can call you out. Talk about authenticity. He can call you out pretty quick, right? So after this happened, he's the only person that called me in the hospital that night. Hmm. So, so he and I were communicating a lot after that because he had experience of working with people like who've gone through stuff. Plus, he's been in the media, and I was in the media like every single day, multiple times. So he was coaching me, and we were in Chicago uh, about a year, maybe a year and a half plus later, right? We were in Chicago doing an event out there at the Hyatt, uh, Hyatt at the airport. And I was in, he asked me to come to a suite. So I went to a suite with Santa. He said, I want to find another security director because it's your time. He said, you've got to take this pathway. It's open to you now. If you don't take it now, you'll never take it. You've got to do it now. He said, I'm going to find another security director because I want, I want to make sure it's easy for you to do this. So that was the last event I ever had with a security form. We were in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I went back. He found somebody else. Just, but he sort of maintain contact with me. What are you doing? How are you doing? What are you going to do? Right. So pushing me, um, which was a very, it was great because I had a mentor that took interest in me mm -hmm. that made me take that step. I was going to take it. I knew I had to take it, but I had a bigger obstacle. My wife, my wife lived on certainty. You know, I'm going to go total uncertainty on her, right? You're going to give up a 30 year career making all this money. My lifestyle is going to get affected, right? So what happened was just about a year and a half later, I still work with Oracle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I promised her, I said, listen, your lifestyle won't go backwards. Mine might, and it has, because an entrepreneur, right? I mean, you take a big risk. But she's never, she hasn't gone backwards with things that she needed once. But she gave me basically permission after the five-year anniversary when I was on CBS, they did a piece on me. And I was on the evening news, CBS evening with Scott Pelley, right? Doing all that stuff. They followed me. She saw it and she said, hey, did, did Oracle call you today? I'm like, nope. She goes, maybe it's time for you to leave. Maybe it's time for you to do this. Because she saw me do this on TV. It's like, wow, he can actually pull, pull this thing off. Right. She had to certify he could pull it off. So uh, then, then you go to be an entrepreneur and all of a sudden you got to figure out everything else, like health insurance and how to collect things. I mean, like a whole different world for me, but it's been a great learning experience. Oh, that's, that's, that's such a inspiring story because now, you know, I know I feel like reaching out to you and getting your book and see what I can do to help you with your cause, right? Because, and because I see you wanting to help others through your experience. And I believe that others may experience the same thing because when you go out as an entrepreneur, it's not an easy decision. And it doesn't necessarily make your life a better quality of life, right? Um, you get a lot of satisfaction and uh, fulfillment out of it. That's right. But it's by no means is it easy. It's a trade-off. There's a trade-off, short, a short-term trade-off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, so uh, 2009 through 2012, all these were happening. Um, 
you became an entrepreneur. Um, so tell us about 2012 through 2018. Um, what is Dave working on? What is Dave excited about? Um, you know, what can we do to stay connected with you? Because I certainly want to stay connected. <laughs> Well, thank you, because this, this is a big, a big year because we're, so we're honed down on what my real messaging is going to be now. My messaging, what I've realized is I've spoken close to 980 plus times around the world, which has given me some great perspective on what people really, how they attract to me and what they want from me. Um, in addition to helping the Red Cross, which is my passion, uh, you know, I've helped them raise over $12.8 million over the last eight years. And I have a goal this year to help them raise another million dollars this year. And also visit the nine states I have a visit to to help raise money in those nine states. So that's a big part of my mission is the Red Cross. But uh, my new branding is cultivating personal leadership. Because what I'm finding out is there's a lot of people after talking about leadership. There's a ton of people. There's a ton of people do a great job of, of it. It's more about business leadership. And I said, well, you got to lead yourself first. And so at Moments Matter, my book Moments Matter, right, right here, is I talk about these moments and how these, these leadership lessons that I learn and, and can implement it and help people. So that's number one. Number two, what I'm really excited about is my radio show starts uh, pretty soon. It's called Moments Matter with Dave Sanderson. And what I'm, the theme of my show is on is going to be, I'm going to be talking to some of the top 1% people in the world, like uh, Captain Sullenberger, um, Dominique Wilkins from the Atlanta Hawks, people who've achieved that like Hall of Fame status. And, I'm, and what Tony teaches is it, the move from excellence to outstanding. Standing out because there's a lot of people who do excellent jobs, but there's only a few that one percent to do outstanding. What's that one percent mindset? So I'm really excited about that. But another thing I'm excited I'm doing, which right now started this last week, is I was approved to be on Alexa. Uh, I have a daily briefing on Alexa. So every day I'm putting out five minutes of this knowledge and strategies out on Alexa it's called Dave Sanderson Declassified. Because what I'm doing is taking these lessons from all these leaders that I've been with, taking one strategy. Yeah, it might be about leadership. It might be about how to be prosperous, whatever, and breaking it down in five minutes and declassifying what people think is, how can I ever do that? I'll give them the strategies. I'm telling the strategies what people just taught me. It's, I'm not taking anything new. All I want to do is tell them how you to do it. So I'm really excited about that likewise. And, and I'm also working with an organization called the Leadership Mindset Series with Dominique Wilkins and Don Barden and Brittany Tucker down in Atlanta. And it's this workshop process working with companies to that one 1% mindset. You know, what's that leadership 1% the difference? So that's, that just started actually this week likewise. So there's a lot of projects on the table in addition to speaking, you know, still speaking around the world and writing my next book in the third quarter of this year. So really excited about all this. Oh, that's, that's a lot of uh, good projects, exciting projects that you're working on. Um, to find out about all those, can, can we go to your website at one, or do you also have a Facebook page? What's the best best way to connect with you or LinkedIn? What's your preference? Well, a lot of people connect with me by way of my website at davesandersonspeaks.com because now I don't have a personal assistant, so it comes straight to me. So you, there's no filters now, so you get straight to me. That's a, plus, you can learn some things about me. But on Facebook, it's Dave Sanderson Speaks. Go to my page. I check it out because that's where I give some of this wisdom that I potentially have and sort of put it there. Uh, LinkedIn, though, is David Sanderson, and that's where I put these business lessons. You want to see some these the more distinctive business lessons on LinkedIn and Twitter is just more hey where what's going on with Dave today, so that's how to do you know how to connect with you. But what I like to offer your audience to is this: um, the one thing I'm finding is I travel around the world, especially in the United States right now. There's a lot of people who are angst have a lot of, uh, of anxiety because they don't know what to expect. There's there's so much uncertainty right now with what's going on, whether it's in Washington or around the country, right? So. I'm putting a new course out. It's coming out in four weeks. But the first video of that is called Overcoming Adversity in Challenging Times. And I really did that more for youth. So the youth can understand in 13 minutes, you know, how do you, how do you overcome something, whether it's a plane crash, whether it's financial challenges, whether it's health, just the strategies how to do that. So if, if they text 797979 and put input brace, the number four impact, I'll send this video for free. They get the first video of my course for free so they can at least – Easy to watch it or pass it on to a youth to watch it. That's my gift to them as, uh, as we start out this uh, 2018. Well, thank you so much, Dave. So just to recap, um, we can text 797979. And is there, a, is there a word you said you have yeah. to type in there? Race, race for impact. The number four. Race for impact. Right. And that's the number four. 
the number four, not four, F O U R, the number four, and then they'll they'll get the video within thirty, hopefully thirty to six, thirty to seconds to a minute later, they'll have the access to the link to the video. Excellent. Um, I will also put that within my show notes as well as uh, wherever else I have the interview here so that people can follow those steps because I believe that that will help a lot of people at least get the exposure to what you have to offer. And I believe that they really need to check out your website to see because you have gone through various stages in life and you've come in touch, you've gotten in touch with important people who have made a big difference by being authentic, by being true leaders. Right. I'm yeah. very honored to do that. I, I've met so many leaders out of this that uh, I never thought you'd have a contact you. All of a sudden you're open, this opens up and all of a sudden you're sitting across with associate justice and Supreme court having a one-on-one. I'm like, pinch me. Right. Yeah. I mean, but it's because I think, I think I served and I think that's, that's the whole thing is about giving back and contribution, gratitude and contribution. Well, I for sure will uh, check out your Facebook page, make a comment out there. Um, I will go to your website and take a look at your book as well. And check out my Alexa daily briefing. And what I've done for you is uh if you don't have an Echo product on Alexa, I've also now been able to upload it to my website. So if you go to Moments Matter blog on my website, you can hear my daily briefing. Okay. There's two ways you can get it. You have an Alexa product or you have uh, have a go to my website. Okay, so those who do not have Alexa, they can just go simply to your website. Click and- on it. Mm-hmm. They won't see my pretty picture come up. <laughs> That's okay. It's all right. They don't need to see my face. <laughs> they'll hear my voice on the uh, the message of that day. Right, and they'll recognize, oh, that's the guy I yeah. saw in 2009 about the Miracle on Hudson. You know? That's right. Exactly so, right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Is there um, some parting uh, piece of uh, guidance or words of wisdom that you'd like to leave with us? Um, that you have learned through the years, that going through various experiences um, that you'd like to share with us, um, the audience? I think the, the last thing I share, especially as we begin, begin this year, is one of the biggest changes that I made after the, the miracle on the Hudson is my perspective on worldview. And what I mean by that is I was pretty judgmental pretty much my whole life. And then something, a couple things happened uh, right after the miracle on the Hudson. And I started judging people and I'm like, I don't know their backstories. I don't know. Maybe they have a reason to respond like this. Maybe I've been, and then I said, well, maybe I've been judging people too harshly for the last 45 plus years. Right. Maybe I also, once I changed that, say, no, I have no basis to judge people and and I'll take them, take them as they are and just respond, not respond the way I would normally respond. That's opened up so many pathways for me because now relationships are coming to me where I now probably have shut off so many other ones because I was judgmental. So look, I would say the advice I said, check your worldview, see how judgmental you are, check your ego at the door. Say, you know what, I don't, if I don't know their backstory, I have no basis to judge, judge them because they may have gone through some very horrific things. And that's why they're probably acting the way that they are. How can I help and serve that? It's about getting to know the people, getting to know their stories. Right. And if we can understand those two things, I believe success comes. And success is different for everybody, right? That's right. Um, but it's getting that peace of mind and with ease, I believe. You cannot rush it. You cannot force it. I, a word I heard somebody tell me once was the word is elegance, right? Just have that elegance. You start, because the people, you may have it, but you don't have the way to sort of process it and just make it elegant to be able to have that kind of conversation. So mm-hmm. I would say with elegance. Well, thank you, Dave. You know, you're always welcome to come back to the show. Thank you very much. Um, the updates you have, just reach out to me and we'll get you scheduled. Um, and it's been a pleasure and uh, we will definitely stay in touch and I will do anything I can to help your cause. Uh, it's a very important one. So thank you, for, thank you for reaching out and it's been a pleasure, Dave. Thank you for having me. I hope when I come to Chicago in a couple months at our paths cross. Yes, please uh, send me a note and uh, uh, I'll make sure to uh, stop by wherever you are and uh, shake your hand in person. That'd be great. I look forward to it. Okay. Thanks, Dave.